Um, so first is, and I already spoke to this, where like there was various steps. There was primary, secondary, and tertiary aspects of training, speed, and agility. And one of them, you know, I spoke to saying, okay, well, we have to practice it, and then we also have to have the appropriate technique. Um, and if you guys remember, the book says strength is a tertiary method for training speed and agility. I told you guys, uh, in my uh, opinion, that is incorrect, and I moved it to be a primary method. So if we're training speed and agility in the gym or in a strength and conditioning setting, right, with regards to strength, strength should address the entire force velocity curve. So if we remember, you know, power being developed somewhere between 30 and 50, 30 and 60 percent of a 1RM, when we're training uh, our clients or our athletes, we want to make sure we're training that entire curve, that force velocity curve, and, and really we're training uh, almost their entire relative load profile. So like a relative load profile is, okay, we're going to train 30% of a 1RM, we're going to train 50% of a 1RM, we're going to train 70%, we're going to train maximum strength and train power. Again, this could be at various times of the year in a properly integrated periodized program. When you're actually uh, attempting to pick the appropriate exercises for the gym, a few things you should also, also think about is identifying the target mechanics. So the example we used in class is, well, is a, is a leg extension or knee extension going to be more appropriate than something like a back squat when training, let's say, a volleyball or a basketball player? And the answer should be um, because the movement mechanics match um, our, our training movements will start to match our movement mechanics. We want to squat. We want to do a back squat. Uh, it's much better than a knee extension. Again, a knee extension, it's not that it's incorrect, but there's probably better alternatives for most of the training year. We want to distinguish between specificity and simulation. So what does this mean? Certain things are going to be um, specific from like a movement uh, perspective, while other things are going to be a, a, a little bit more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Other things are going to be simulated at like game speed. So specificity, it could be like doing a slow eccentric, which might mimic um, the movement pattern. It's specific to the movement pattern, but simulation really uh, incorporates more of a appropriate velocity or matching velocity. Uh, one of the things that your text uh, refers to is that targeting two different points of the stretch shortening cycle are going to be helpful for uh, really matching all of your demands in sports. So we really break it down as long and short response plyometrics. So a long response plyometric is where our ground contact time is greater than 0.25 seconds. All right, so this is useful for starts and accelerations where our ground contact time is much longer. So some examples of ac activities that have long responses greater than 0.25 seconds are something like a squat jump, where you jump up, you land in the squat, jump up again, your ground contact time could be half a second, it could be an entire second. Um, same thing with a bunny hop. On the other opposite or the other end of the spectrum is a short response plyometric, and these things are very rapid, quick ground contact times. Um, and this is useful for maximum velocity. Where, if you remember earlier on in the slide, we said that you know at top end sprint speeds, our foot is coming in contact with the ground approximately 0.1 seconds long, right? So that's a very, very short ground contact time, so we have to train this. We have to train our feet, our Achilles, our calves to produce that force we need in a very short period of time. So some activities or exercises that are going to be helpful for developing this are something like a stiff-legged hop. Being stiff-legged is going to recruit the tendon more and the muscle less. Jump ropes are phenomenal. Depth jumps, when done correctly, um, are, are great. Um, now moving over to speed endurance. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, your, book, your book has a nice page outlining each of these methods, but uh, for developing speed endurance, they list the classic methods, and there's four different classic methods that the book lists. Competitive trial, distance duration, interval methods, and, and 
And this is just standard methods for building speed endurance, right? These are the classic methods. From there, it also outlines something they call tactical metabolic training. And tactical metabolic training is very different than the classic methods because what it does is it follows team sport specificity. So in a sport like football, where your average play in football is, I don't know, what about four to five, four to seven seconds long, something along those lines. And then from there, between plays, you guys might have uh, a 30 second break between, uh, between downs. Uh, so what it'll do is it will have athletes perform really high intensity efforts for approximately five, seven seconds. They'll have a 30 second rest period rinse and repeat just exactly like that. So, so your training starts to mimic your actual team sports games and matches. And that's what the tactical metabolic training method is. And you really have to be um, very familiar with the sport to make sure it matches. Uh, I think this is my last slide here. Um, this, it's a weird chapter. It's like a hodgepodge of things. And, and, and it talks a decent bit about motor learning. And here are a few of the elements of motor learning. Motor learning is pretty cool. Um, it, I could spend an entire semester teaching motor learning. So this is just a few of the elements. Um, the book briefly starts to talk about physical practice versus mental practice. Um, and, and it illustrates how important mental practice is, which I 100% agree with. But then from there, it goes on to all the ways we can incorporate physical practice. So physical practice, first and foremost, is the total amount of practice matters. We need to make sure that our clients or our athletes are getting more time and more duration. Um, you know, the, the general rule of thumb is 10 years or 10,000 hours for mastery. So having said that, generally speaking, more practice is better. It is better to practice five hours per week than it is two hours per week. How do we how do we break our practices um, or how do we break apart our movements? So whole versus part practice of movements, right, um, really depends on the number uh, of movements or parts and the interdependence of those parts. So if we're thinking of a, of a given movement, let's say we're thinking of uh, hurdles, right? So the hurdles, if you think of a competitive hurdler, there's various parts or components to the hurdle race. There's your lead leg. There's your trail leg. There's your lead leg arm. There's your trail leg arm. There's your foot position. Okay, so there's various parts to this skill. Well, how do we actually teach hurdles to a client? Do we go with, we just have them go and hurdle, which would be considered a perfect whole practice uh, or whole skill practice, or do we break them up into smaller parts? Um, and it really depends on the number of them and the interdependence of these parts. So like in the case of hurdling, Oftentimes we practice the legs because they're more interdependent on each, uh, each other relative to the arms. So we'll practice the lead leg, we'll practice the trail leg, then we'll put them together. Then from there, we might uh, emphasize the lead arm, the trail arm, put them together, and then we'll put the entire piece together. It also uh, depends on the athlete's developmental status. Uh, when working with a younger or novice athlete, you're more likely to really break everything down into its individual components first. Um, but again, it depends on how old they are. Complex tasks are better suited for part practice. So if there are a lot of parts, you know, hurdles got, you know, four to six different parts, which is a decent amount, um, we, we break them apart. If it's something a little bit simpler, you know, something that might be considered simpler is maybe like just shooting a jump shot, right? No dribbling, right? There's various pieces, you know, uh, depending on the school of thought you come from with shooting a basketball, but I don't know, you get your elbow directly under the ball, you create that L or U shape, half U shape, you make sure you push up, your elbow finishes above the eye, you snap your wrist, so on and so forth. Um, so it, it depends. Uh, shooting a jump shot can be much less complex than some combinatory basketball movement where you do a crossover between the leg dribble into a spin, something like that. Uh, another important piece of motor learning is the type of feedback and instruction you're giving. Um, extrinsic feedback uh, for novice or complex skills. So what that means, if somebody's complete beginner, think about like a seven or eight year old who's just learning to pick up a basketball, 
they're going to need a lot more feedback than, let's say, a 18-year-old who's picked up a basketball before but maybe was never coached. That 18-year-old who's picked up the basketball before probably has an intuitive feel for what it feels like to dribble, so on and so forth. Um, uh, another thing you could say is something's a very complex skill, there's going to be a need for more feedback. A big takeaway from this piece is that you want to be careful about overcoaching. Um, I, I really try to avoid overcoaching. Sometimes I think it's best to, you know, you give a few instructions and then let the athletes develop an intuitive feel for how to develop. So a uh, case in point is I was very fortunate to have coached an incredibly skilled hurdler. He broke the New York State record in the 55 hurdles. It was a 33-year-old record, and he's now the fastest hurdler in the history of New York State. Um... For his, really for his junior and senior year, you know, I coached him since his freshman year, but for his junior and senior year during hurdle practices, I was not giving him a tremendous amount of coaching. Um, I would give him the workouts to do, but I wasn't correcting him that much. Uh, he, he had a strong feel for the hurdles and I didn't need to break apart or nitpick every single thing. Um, he was very intuitive and could make corrections when need be on his own. Um, comparatively, when I'm working with a new hurdler, I spent most of my time helping develop those new hurdlers. So that's what I mean by overcoaching. You don't want to provide too much instruction, especially if it's not entirely needed. Um, practice distribution. So here we're talking about, are we practicing, is it better to practice two hours per week, uh, let's say two hours straight on a Monday, or is it better to practice four days a week for a half hour? Uh, we've got a lot of research on this, and this is what we would consider a distributed practice. We, it, it seems to be much more helpful for skill acquisition for a higher frequency. So we want to practice more frequently for those shorter blocks than that in that long uh, long practice. Uh, practice variation, blocked versus varied. Um, varied practice means like really introducing some sort of new stimulus and it can be helpful. So what I have here is varied may reduce short-term performance. So when you introduce some sort of new stimulus and you vary or change things around, um, you might have an athlete for a week or two uh, have a reduction in performance, but it's very helpful to promote long-term skill acquisition. Um, and here's just a few stories of, of how I apply motor learning when working with clients. Um, I'll start with like the, J, the JT clean story. I have an athlete who, in my opinion, had what I would call uh, um, athlete amnesia. You know, so I, sh I showed him the barbell clean, which is a, you know, it's a fairly complex movement. It's a much more complex than something like a goblet squat or a dumbbell curl. So I taught him the clean and, you know, after about a month, I realized, you know, he was doing the clean once a week and he just wasn't getting it. Some days it would be pretty good. Other days it would be really bad. So what happened was I realized he needed a higher frequency. So we went from one day a week to two days a week and it still wasn't clicking. So after another, you know, three, four weeks, I realized, all right, what I want you to do is I want you to clean every time you walk through the gym. It didn't necessarily have to be heavy. It was light most of the time, but just getting a uh, exposure to a higher frequency really helped him improve his skill acquisition of the barbell clean. And then kind of along the same lines is uh, I'm trying something new with my track and field team this year. Um, with my track and field team, you know, there's various with, there's various events within um, the umbrella of being a sprinter. There's short sprints, there's long sprints, there's the horizontal jumps, long jump, triple jump, there's the hurdles, there's the high jump, there's the pole vault. So in order to improve scale acquisition for my athletes, uh, I'm actually developing a, a station model for practice. So twice a week, I've got about five or six stations that athletes are going to rotate from. You know, uh, let's say uh, I've got about 15 athletes, 20 athletes per group, and they're going to go from station to station, getting these short 20-minute exposures to each different skill. Um, and by hopefully by giving them this increased exposure, it's going to increase that skill acquisition. At least that's my goal.